it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the Rumi Forum. Actually, I've never been here before. Um, I actually, I think, maybe did maybe five or six years ago when it was still a very small organization in Georgetown, the, the seed that this building has now become. But I'm very excited to see the development of this, uh, this organization and its obvious uh, growing impact on Washington, which I think desperately needed a voice that could speak uh, for Islamic issues um, and on behalf of Islamic issues in in the world, it's it's um, we're the the town is outgunned by those who are perhaps less less sympathetic to um, to uh, problems of Islam and issues of Islam. In any case, uh, the issue uh, tonight is uh, indeed my book. Um, it's as you know, it's called A World Without Islam. Uh, some of you may recall that about three, less than three years ago, I wrote a an article by the same name, called uh, by the same name, um, in Foreign Policy magazine, and it set forth a thesis which I presented in, in brief, but that I was then asked by a New York publisher, Little Brown, to expand upon. So I I did. I like the title for a couple of reasons. First of all, as, as people have pointed out to me, when you see a, a title, A World Without Islam, does this mean it's pro-Islam or does it mean anti-Islam? And I mentioned this to the publisher and they said, ambiguity is good. <laughs> it'll, it'll sell more <laughs> copies. Um, but more to the point, I wanted a title which would, and not only a title but a thesis, which represents kind of guerrilla journalism, if you will. Um, something that would maybe be a little more provocative and shocking to people and to make them reconsider issues uh, of the role of Islam in relations between the Middle East and the West. Just to make sure you all know, the book is not saying if there, was, if there had never been an Islam, the world would be the same. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if there had never been an Islam or never been a Prophet Muhammad, that the relationship between the West, and particularly the United States, and the Middle East would perhaps not be significantly different than it is today. That's the argument. So um, I pr try to proceed to demonstrate this, and of course it's a very, I mean, it's a what-if question. It's highly speculative. What if there had never been uh, a Prophet Muhammad? What, did it, what if there had never been a, a Jesus Christ? What if there had never been um, a Hitler or a Stalin or a Lenin or uh, a George Washington? I mean, you can go on asking very, very interesting questions about what might have happened in the world if X, Y, or Z had not happened. In this case, uh, so my suggestion that if there had never been a Prophet Muhammad is certainly not meant to, to denigrate or insult uh, either the Prophet or Islam, but to suggest that the problems between the West and the Middle East today have really very little to do with Islam. Now, there are many, and I don't need to tell you this, you know, there are many in, 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 in Washington, in the United States, in the West, who are quite convinced that this is uh, about Islam. And after all, bin Laden has, particularly bin Laden, but not uniquely, has done wonders for teaching the West Arabic. Uh, the number of Arabic words we have learned as a result of all this has grown hugely. Uh, we now know jihad and mujahid and mujahideen and, ij and ijtihad and jihad and fatwa and madrasa and keep on. I mean, there's more of them involved here. Emir, and, you know, I don't, we, we keep learning these words. Um, so th the implication is that when we ha know all these words, that of course uh, the problem is due to issues of Islam. This is a very convenient argument. Because when you say the problem is essentially Islam and Islamic culture, then the problem is them. Uh, and what is wrong, and, and I've participated myself for my sins in writing uh, articles not against Islam and on this subject, but talking about potential threat situations and analyses um, in the past relating to you know, other countries, China or, or Russia or whatever. But um, I think there is a tendency, especially in Washington, to be looking for what is wrong with 
let's say Saudi Arabia, and there are things wrong with Saudi Arabia or with any country, but the focus on wh why are we, do we have these, what's wrong with Saudi Arabia, what's wrong with Islam, what's wrong with Muslims, how can we change Islam, how can we change what Muslims think, how can we change how Muslims act to fix this problem of relations between the Middle East and the West. Um, you know that this represents very sloppy, uh, lazy thinking. Uh, because it, it, it frees the West, frees the United States from bearing any responsibility for any of these events that have taken place. Now, I'm not here to place blame one way or the other, but when you consider that the, on the one hand the United States claims and prides itself on the fact that it has been the sole global superpower with maybe a thousand military bases scattered around the world, uh, the, the greatest army that the world has ever known in history, uh, the a huge economy, uh, dominant economy, a dominant soft power, all of these things in which Americans pride themselves. Um, to, and, and a footprint, as the, as the Pentagon openly calls it, the American footprint, um, like Godzilla or something, um, the, that the, how can that much power have no impact on events that happen in the rest of the world? Even if you say that the blame is to be divided 50-50 for problems that emerge, okay, 50-50, but at least it's, it goes well beyond, it suggests the need for some introspection into ourselves and our own policies that might have led to these uh, situations. And that is a, an indeed an important theme in this book. Um, a second bumper sticker, if you will, in the book is that history did not begin with 9-11. I think we as Americans have a strong tendency to believe that history did begin with 9-11. Gee whiz, here we were just minding our own business, trying to keep the world safe for democracy and freedom and freedom of the seas and free enterprise and all of a sudden we were attacked by these uh, crazy people from overseas uh, in, in, a, in a hideous attack. Well it was a hideous attack and an outrageous attack and a criminal attack but nonetheless history did not begin there and those of you who have lived in the Middle East or Americans included who, who like, like myself and many of my good friends who are in this room uh, have, have, have uh, understood we knew for many years that things were getting worse in the region. It didn't take great brains to know this from talking to friends, associates, reading the press, listening to media, uh, the anguish, the small outbreaks of violence here, there, elsewhere. It, it was sort of fairly evident that something bad at some point was likely to happen because the situation was getting worse every, every few years. Nobody knew, or few precious people, few people could have guessed that 9-11 would have been the exact outcome. But it shouldn't have been a surprise that radicals in the Me Middle East at some point would move decisively to try to bring the attack back against the United States. So I'm not even trying, I don't want to have to get into arguments about who is more to blame, whether the United States caused it or Bin Laden caused it, or, but I'm suggesting that history did not begin then and to solve the problem we have to go back and look at the roots of all of these conflicts. If you now, th I'll I'll give you very briefly what the 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 uh, main theme of the book is. I've I've already suggested the main one that with if Islam had not existed, there would still be major tensions between the Middle East and 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 the West. Even if we go way back into history, there were geopolitical problems between what was the East and then the West, namely between the Persian Empire, uh, which was under Zoroastrian faith. Uh, Parsis, who still are, still exist, uh, and the Greeks, who I guess we would have to call them pagan, although that's not a very good word, but anyway, these two empires fought representing in, to some degree the, pa the geopolitical power of the East versus the geopolitical power of the West. This is before Christianity, before Islam, of course. So those tensions and back and forth the Greeks and Romans fought over Anatolian territory and up into Greece and all over into, into Iran. 
Following that, we had the Roman Empire, which uh, moved after founding itself in Rome, began then to move around 300 B AD to Constantinople, or today's Istanbul, and founded this extraordinary Byzantine Christian Eastern Orthodox Empire that lasted from 300 uh, AD until 1453. So this is an amazingly long empire of 1100 years or so. Even though that was Christian, uh, it was beginning to develop problems with Rome fairly early on, and these problems increased and increased. It, it basically wasn't about religion. Uh, it was about geopolitical power and turf, and who would have the right to convert, uh, let's say, the pagans in the Balkans, or the Slavic pagans, or other peoples uh, in the Middle East. These problems got progressively worse and worse and worse. Some, ta some of, the, uh, of the conflict was expressed, however, in religious terms. Why not? If you can express them in religious terms, it's much more dignified and, 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 and important than to simply suggest we have, we're struggling over turf or power. So, as some of you may know, the <coughs> ultimate moment in, was the great uh, schism between the Roman Western Latin Empire and the Greek Christian Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Empire was, and I'm, I have a terrible memory for dates, 1150... 1054. 1054, thank you sir. I knew there would be somebody. Uh, I write the books but I forget them very fast. Um, 1054, I think all of you know the immediate cause of this break apart, bre of, of this breakup was the extraordinary argument over the nature of the Holy Spirit. Now I think we know ourselves that the Holy Spirit is a difficult concept in Christianity. Uh, and it's people, are, there are many different ways to think about what the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost represents. But the debate was essentially, was the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, did the Holy Ghost descend from God the Father directly or was he descend, or did the Holy Spirit descend from God the Father and God the Son, namely Jesus Christ? And um, the Roman Church insisted it was both God the Father and God the Son. And over this issue, which is even today extraordinarily difficult to understand, if at all, these two empires burst apart, uh, a shattering Christianity between East and West forever after. And to this day, there are great anger and bitterness between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism in a number of respects. Though the Pope John Paul tried to heal some of these wounds, but it was only to a, to a partial degree. So, I mean, when, you're, when you consider that this was the issue on which things split apart, and it was supposedly a religious break, a religious uh, breakup, uh, and each side declared the other anathema and basically attacked fear. Um, you know that something else is going on here. It's like when you go to a friend's house and the husband and wife fly into a rage and start throwing...